Is constant change a new status quo? How's the economic situation in CEE and Eurozone? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the head of CEE Research for Sparebank, Vladimir Vanio. Good morning, everybody. Two friends went for a trip into a forest. And as they sit around the fireplace, there was a big bear out of the woods. And one of those friends starts running, and the second one goes back to the tent and starts to put on his running shoes. And the one who's running is turning around and says, what are you doing? Do you think those running shoes will help you to run faster than the bear? And he says, no, they will help me to run faster than you. <laughs> uh, I'm glad, I'm very honored to be invited to speak on this conference, and I'm glad to see uh, this engaged audience uh, eager to get the best running shoes to stay ahead of the competition. Uh, in my brief overview, I'll try to just point you into the direction of the most important indicators uh, that might help you as a credit managers to get a better grasp of, of what's going on in the economy of Eurozone, Central and Eastern Europe, and globally. Uh, ever since uh, 2007, we've been hearing about crisis. It was a subprime crisis, and there was a, a crisis, economic crisis, a European uh, debt crisis, a Greek crisis. It almost appears that we live in an uh, environment where this traditional uh, swings between the expansions and recessions do not exist. Uh, some people even think that we actually might live in a very different world where the theory of economic, uh, uh, economic cycle does not hold anymore. Some, some people extremely, and that's uh, the, my first question or my first quiz for you, even think that actually what we have seen over the past few years has destroyed the market economy as we have known it until 2007. Therefore, I want to ask you a question. What do you think? Uh, is, is what we are experiencing over the past few years a proof that uh, the capitalism and market economy has, has failed and we need to think about something different? Uh, definitely, maybe, maybe no, and definitely no. I'm really curious to see uh, your answers. A, B, C, D, uh, you're voting, thanks, and we wait for the, for the, for the results. Uh, because that's, that's, that's actually something that I've been, I've been challenged with uh, very, very often, and that, that's why I want to open my, my presentation with, with uh, just stating the, not stating the obvious, uh, but state, stating uh, what's, what's important. Ah, <laughs> same to people. I uh, think uh, definitely yes. That, that's very interesting to see. But uh, yeah, most of most of you are very right, uh, right on spot. The 41 uh, percent uh, of people who say that uh, the market economy and capitalism has not failed. Uh, that's that's actually the right answer. And here I'll illustrate why. Why is it so? This is not my heartbeat, <laughs> waiting for this whole thing to, uh, coming up. Uh, this is actually condensed economic history of the United States after the World War II. What we have experienced in 2009 was indeed the deepest global economic recession in the post-war history. But nevertheless, what you can see over and over again, uh, the uh, economic cycles, uh, recessions, uh, following expansions, uh, pretty much within the theory of seven to eight years for average business cycle. What was different now in 2009, and that's why the recession hit us so significantly, was that it was preceded by unprecedentedly long period of expansion. Even some economists did think that uh, economic cycle is that at that moment. Just like now somebody thinks that the market economy has failed, it, it has we are back growing uh, over 3% globally this year. Uh, the IMF expect the global growth to accelerate to almost 4% in 2014. Uh, over that period in the 90s and early in this millennia, even some economists thought like new normal is permanent growth. No, it is not. 
uh, new normal is that actually the swings of the recessions and expansions might be more frequent. Uh, we need, to, and, and that, that's why we need to adapt to this more frequent uh, switches of, uh, of the economic, uh, the economic cycles. Uh, coming back to what's the main topic of, uh, of my, my presentation, uh, what to expect in the <laughs> Central Europe, uh, Central Europe, another, another quiz just to keep you <coughs> engaged. Uh, the Central European economies are extremely small, very open, depend on uh, external trade. I just want to, again, uh, give a relatively easy question, but let's, let's see the, the answer to the first one. It was very interesting to me. Uh, Central European economies, when it comes to the external demand export, depend on A, France, B, Germany, C, Eurozone, or D, the European Union. Uh, let's see the voting. Uh, yes, uh, there are more, more uh, correct answers th this time. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you, you got them all. Over one half of the exports from Central and Eastern Europe go to the countries. 84% uh, of the exports of CE go to uh, European Union. And yes, you are right, the single biggest uh, export partners for the CE countries is Germany. I'll illustrate that in the case of uh, Slovakia in particular. So when, when, when answering the question, uh, what the future holds for CE. You know, we need first to understand what the future holds for our export markets. The size of these circles represent the share of the exports uh, for Slovakia. Germany is the single biggest export partner with one fifth of the exports. Overall, <coughs> European Union, uh, the domestic market, the domestic market for Central and Eastern European countries represents 84% of their exports. This just illustrates if any of you is a fond of statistics and you want to find a real life example of uh, meaningful uh, uh, correlation, uh, until 2001 maybe, it appeared that Central and Eastern European economies are grown on their own. So you saw you know, Germany, Eurozone expanding, uh, C countries you know, actually experiencing recession at the end of the uh, 99. What we have seen after 2001 with all this FDI-driven expansion of industrial export uh, capacities is that the sy synchronization between the uh, business cycle of Germany, Eurozone, and Central Europe has increased in 2009 is the best proof. This is in particular data for the Slovakia. Recession in Germany or Eurozone is something unavoidable for the CE countries. We have seen it also in 2012-2013. Uh, expansion in the export market is something that can uh, give hope for economic expansion in uh, CE countries. Uh, when, so when asked, uh, taking it one step uh, further, even Germany as the biggest trading partner of the Eurozone, again the voting is on, uh, is a relatively open economy. Some people say, oh, these Central Europeans, they are weird because they depend so much on the export. The reality is that Germany, being the biggest economy in the Eurozone, is the second biggest uh, exporter in the world, right after China. So when trying to understand where is Germany and Eurozone going, we also need to understand the external demand factor. And that's uh, why I asked this second question, which might not be uh, all that obvious. Uh, who's the biggest trading partner of Eurozone? Let's see, let's see uh, the results. Uh, because that then that, that that helps us to answer that helps us to answer again uh, what we can expect in the eurozone. Uh, ah, uh, here you see, here you see. I mean, you got a lot of the right answers. Uh, no, China China is not the biggest trading partner of eurozone. It's actually still U.S. It used to be 28 percent. It's now down to 18 percent but it, that's twice the share of the exports from Eurozone to China. Even though the growth there and the dynamics, the dynamics of the growth uh, is uh, one of the strongest, but it's really it's USA, United Kingdom, and uh, then China, uh, followed by Russia, Turkey, etc. Uh, the United, for United Kingdom, as sort of a cousin uh, of the US, again, the US is the main trading partner, so 
When trying to answer the, the question uh, about the future of the Euro European economy, uh, we need to understand this transatlantic link. So we look into what, what the future holds for the US, and there you could ask, okay, Central and Eastern Europe is driven by the Germany Eurozone. The Eurozone is driven by its strong demand to US, UK, China, etc. So who does, who does uh, who's driving the growth in the US? The US market is specific because it's not only the biggest economy in the world, or the second biggest if you take the European Union, <coughs> Union as, as a whole, but it's very specific in that two thirds of the US economy is represented by the service sector. And as we all know, services can be exported, but it's a bit clumsy. Uh, service sector depends predominantly on the strength of the domestic demand. And the backbone of the domestic demand is the labor market. And when we look at the development of the American uh, labor market over the past five years, that's another proof that, no, we are no longer in a crisis. We are in that expansionary part of the uh, economic cycle, even though it's uh, shaky, but basically the unemployment rate in the US is back to where it was in the spring of 2008. The job creation is going on even though at a slower pace than what was the hit during the crisis. The biggest post-war recession created a hit of nine million jobs lost in the US. Uh, over the past five years, we have recovered a uh, major majority of that. We are now at over eight million newly created jobs, even though the job creation was significantly slower. Two remarks on to, to that chart, because it's very, uh, very, very good description. First, some people say that the recession in 2009, that big recession, was caused by the collapse of the Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers happened in September 2008, uh, and the recession in US actually started in December 2007. So it was not the Lehman Brothers that triggered the recession, it was the Lehman Brothers that made it significantly worse. Even without that dark moment of the hit in the history of the Wall Street, we would have seen the job losses, but until Lehman Brothers, we have seen job losses up to 200,000 uh, every month. After Lehman Brothers, the job losses quadrupled to almost 800,000 uh, jobs. And these are not the people who lost jobs on the Wall Street or in Lehman Brothers alone. These are people from the real economy, companies that found uh, m it more difficult to access credit, that uh, suddenly saw the evaporation of the demand from their trading partners. Events such as Lehman Brothers can have profound impact on the real economy. Some people say when we have uh, heard all this light-hearted discussion about the collapse of the Eurozone and breakup of the Euro, many of the observers said that such an event like a co uh, collapse of the Euro or break, break up, breakup of the Eurozone would be an event that would overshadow the importance of the, or the impact of the Lehman Brothers on the real economy, something to keep in mind. But nevertheless, looking at our uh, major trading partner in the US, we see the domestic demand rebounding, the consumer confidence is at its, high, at its highest since uh, 2007, so it, it's back uh, at the level from uh, start of the recession. We are nowhere close to this irrational exuberance that we have seen before 2007, uh, but nevertheless, we are climbing from the 30 year lows, that's why I use this long history. What we have experienced during 2009 was, in terms of the consumer confidence, for example, in the US, was the worst since the end of the 90s, since that uh, large oil shock at the end of the uh, 70s. Uh, I do not have a uh, crystal ball when I'm uh, answering the question what the future holds for the economy, but instead of a crystal ball, I use some of the real life so called forward looking indicators even you can follow relatively easily. Uh, and these forward-looking indicators, they have nothing to do with the analysts or bank economists like myself. Uh, this uh, forward-looking indicator is based on this survey among purchasing managers, people who are responsible for stocking their companies. And basically every month they get a simple question with three mutually, ex uh, uh, ex mutually exclude, excluding uh, answers. Are you stocking your company as if the production next month is increasing, decreasing, or remains unchanged. The difference between all these answers is this one uh, num figure, the forward-looking index of activity. Basically, when it's about 50, the uh, majority
majority of the answers or the answers we stock to company for expansion or no change is higher than those who uh, are actually lowering their inventories. This indicator has been relatively useful in predicting recession at the end of 2007, as well as the end of the recession in 2009. It, here it showed why the American economy in 2012, 2013 was on the brink of uh, serious economic slowdown, and here it explained why Fed uh, took that third qualitative, quantitative uh, easing step. Basically, when we look now, we see that, especially the activity in the uh, service sector is at its best since uh, almost summer 2006. Uh, the activity in manufacturing has softened, but nevertheless remains in the expansion growth territory. So coming back from the US is doing well, and it seems it's on track for the expansion, part of the explanation why Fed is now considering tightening the interest rates and starting to exit <coughs> from that ultra loose monetary policy. Another, another uh, quiz question engage was the relationship between strong strong demand and economic growth in eurozone none always positive mostly positive or i don't know uh, the, the answer most likely is uh, self-explanatory as i have uh, shown uh, the relationship shared the relationship between the uh, trade relationship between eurozone and the, and the us let's wait for the results um, Uh, uh, the, the, uh, and, 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 and the answer, the answer you, the, I, I assume that you will, most of you will get, get this one right. Uh, but the answer, the answer is also more tricky that, than it appears. At the first side, it should be self-explanatory. The biggest trading partner, uh, whatever happens in the US, happens in the Eurozone. It's almost no-brainer. Yeah, correct. Always positive, mostly positive. You got it exactly, exactly right. We do depend on the Eurozone. And, but there is one important but. With that, I go back to that yellow line about Lehman Brothers in the uh, in Eurozone. So we can let's continue. Um, so yes, what we have seen in uh, now answering the question, what's in the future for the Eurozone? What we have seen in 2009 was recession started in the US, uh, recession spilled over to the Eurozone. Recession ended in the US, we have seen recovery in 2011, 2012. Look what happened here, 2012, 2013. That's the period of the Eurozone debt crisis. That's the period of all this discussion about the breakup of the Euro. Even though our external demand continued to grow in the US like a knife to butter. We went into repeated recession of 2012, 2013 exactly because of that spillover from the confidence in the, uh, in the uh, financial markets into economy. Nevertheless, at this point, with a small hesitation last summer, we see that forward-looking indicators point to a uh, relatively salient uh, recovery in the services as well as in manufacturing activity. One point to 2014, we have seen that in the second half of 2013 and first half of 2014, first half of last year was extremely strong, extremely mm -hmm. successful. The increase of the geopolitical uh, tensions in the second half of 2014 was enough to, uh, uh, to bring uh, growth prospects almost to stalling. So uh, once the geopolitical tensions escalated last autumn, even the German government has halved its growth uh, well, growth forecast for this year. Nevertheless, now we see we continue to expand. Another forward-looking indicator, the uh, index of confidence of the German businesses points to uh, especially the assessment of the current situation being the strongest since 2011. Expectations part is a bit hesitant, again, because of these repeated geopolitical tensions that has the potential to undermine the business confidence. Investors' confidence, that's another of these forward-looking indicators, points to the fact that the big money managers are actually the most optimistic about assessment of the current situation also since the end of 2010. Uh, here you again see in the most recent months a bit of a hesitation when it comes to the expectations for the future, exactly because of that, of that uh, uh, geopolitical tension. Very quick uh, uh, quiz again. Do soft indicators matter for the hard data from the real economy? You as the credit managers who are used to work with the hard data, the, the accounting data might wonder, why do I spend that much time about the 
soft indicators, the surveys among the uh, manufacturing managers uh, or among businesses or among uh, big investors, aren't they just uh, opinion polls? So do they matter? Never ever, sometimes very much, don't know. Uh, let's uh, wait for the, let's wait for the uh, result. Because uh, that's also something you don't need, you don't need economists to tell you that there will be a recession within seven to eight years at latest. Because as I've shown at the very beginning, you can't, we can't get out of the business cycle, uh, uh, business cycle uh, inevita inevitability. Uh, exactly, you have a brilliant audience and very attentive audience. I did spend that much time uh, with this business indicators because they do matter the soft indicators do matter a lot for the real economy, for the hard data. Let's uh, let's move uh, to illustration why they do matter. The the thing with the hard hard data, for example, the GDP growth is that we usually know it. We measure it on a quarterly basis and usually with a significant time lag. So in September we discussed what was the e growth in the second quarter, which is not that much use useful for your purposes as a business manager. Whereas this. Soft indicators, the business confidence, the uh, manufacturing service are available on a monthly basis. And here you can see the relationship between the uh, business confidence in Germany and the, actually the real economic growth later on. Uh, we see that recovery, not in the soft data, also is accompanied by the recovery of the hard data. Uh, again, illustration of the real economic growth in the Eurozone and the index of the investor confidence, which now points to ongoing expansion. So that's why with a little bit of caution we can be relatively optimistic. For the C region, one of the most important uh, factors or the uh, uh, industries is the automotive. This year, after many, many not really optimistic uh, years or uh, let's say after uh, four years of declines or unsustainable recoveries, we see increasing number of double digit growth in the new car registrations. We have seen uh, almost double digit uh, new cars registration even in September, even though they were hit by the uh, Volkswagen scandal. Uh, going back to the CE, recovery in Germany, recovery in the growth prospects for the Eurozone bodes well for the recovery of the industrial production, especially of this smaller CE economies such as Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary that are dependent, very much dependent on, uh, on external demand. Here, one reflection regarding the topical story of Jaguar in Slovakia. Notice 2012-2013, Czech Republic and uh, Hungary have seen repeated recession, which is unsurprising because we uh, explained how much CE countries depend on uh, external demand. So recession in Eurozone, recession in Hungary, Czech Republic, not in Slovakia. What happened? Look, the industrial production in Slovakia was flying relatively high. That was the period when Volkswagen put into operation new 1 billion euro facility. So speaking about the Jaguar coming into Slovakia, some might say, yeah, why is that such a fuss? You know, it's expensive car. Very few people actually can, can buy the Jaguar investment for Slovak economy. That's almost 2 billion investment. And you can expect sizable positive impact uh, on the economy, <coughs> as we have seen with that facility of the Volkswagen. Now, just a few reflections regarding the monetary policy in the Eurozone, before I conclude. Uh, one of the popular now complaints about what European Central Bank is doing that, oh, why do they keep the interest rates at zero and why do they buy all these government bonds? They're gonna cause hyperinflation, they're gonna cause uh, prices rising uh, exorbitantly. Some people even like to say that the ECB is printing money and it's, it's too much, so let's, Let's answer. Do you think hyperinflation is only a matter of time? Uh, there is no relation between the monetary policy and inflation. Uh, maybe uh, there is a threat of, for the stability of consumer prices coming from the monetary policy of ECB. Uh, or B, uh, there is no threat of inflation without solid credit growth. Uh, this one, again, will, I assume is, is, is a bit, bit more, more tricky, even though we have seen experience with uh, loose monetary policy, ex extremely long period of loose monetary policy in the US and its impact on the inflation. So I guess uh, 
a lot of you will know what to think about the answer answer a basically despite all that loose monetary policy in the uh, US we haven't seen anything <coughs> like the uh, high inflation uh, let's, wait, let's wait for the results just before I illustrate uh, how to perceive uh, this this long period of ultra loose uh, monetary policy of the ECB correct yeah you are you are really a <laughs> great and uh, uh, informed audience even though I mean one quarter of you really did buys this story that ultra loose monetary policy will lead to hyperinflation uh, in uh, anytime soon. What we have seen in the US, uh, we, can, we can move on to, to, to my next slide to, to, to illustrate. And what we have seen in the US is that uh, even with ultra loose monetary policy, as most of you have answered, without demand for credit from the private sector, from households and, uh, uh, and companies, the, there is no uh, credible risk of the uh, acceleration of the inflation. Quite the contrary, we now face the opposite risk, risk of the deflation. So the red line is this, and we can see it's really flying high. But as you can see, during the recession in 2009-2010, that explains your answer D, that most of you got right. Uh, ECB is printing money like hell, and the overall money supply in the economy is slowing down. The, the green line is all the money supply in the economy, something that depends whether the uh, that is in uh, imbalance between the demand, the volume of money, and the total uh, volume of the goods and services. If there is imbalance between total volume of money and uh, total volume of goods and services, there there is a risk that this imbalance will be uh, re reached again by higher inflation. We see that even with printing press going on like crazy, money supply did slow down because companies actually deleverage during the crisis. Uh, well, households do not take on new debt when unemployment is going up. What we see now is again acceleration of the printing press of this most liquid, uh, most liquid money that sits in the bank, but without demand of the private sector, households and companies for the debt, the money, overall money supply is recovering only gradually. This is consistent with the economic recovery, so there is uh, improvement, but the growth of money supply is nowhere close to the double digit where it was before 2008, so that risk of hyperinflation uh, is not really that acute. Here we can see that actually we have come out of two years of still significant deleveraging in terms of the corporate loans. Thanks to this ultra loose monetary policy of the ECB, the credit market in Eurozone is only gradually recovering when it comes to the credit growth. One popular complaint about this ultra loose monetary policy, it's creating the risk of the moral hazards. Uh, money is almost free, well available, abundant. Uh, the, the households will do bad decisions. We see that the credit management in the banks, regulation, but also the common sense of the households should not be underestimated. We see that even with the free, uh, cheap, uh, and well accessible money, there is no dramatic uh, increase in the lending to the households in the Eurozone. This is again just an illustration of where the money supply was an issue uh, before 2008 when ECB hiked its interest rates all the way to almost 4.5%. Now, <coughs> it's nowhere close to, to, to being an issue. Uh, that, that's, uh, uh, that's one thing. Uh, on the other hand, as I, as I mentioned, in the Eurozone, we actually have uh, almost a year of annual decline of the consumer prices, which is offer, uh, often linked, you can start voting on, uh, it's often <coughs> linked with the Japanese scenario. Uh, all, all we know about, Jap well, most of people know about Japanese scenario, it's not nice. Economists call it the lost decade, a period of protracted deflation, declining consumer uh, prices, uh, associated with the stagnation, economic stagnation, significant increase of the unemployment, uh, etc. So the question that's really uh, top, very uh, up to date in the Eurozone, is this decline of the consumer prices worrying you? Uh, not yet. Um, it's great because uh, things get cheaper, uh, uh, don't they? It might be a risk. For D, it's an alarming risk. Uh, just while we wait for the, for the results, just a very quick and simplified illustration why decline in consumer prices, which is great. I mean, things get cheaper. What's wrong with that? It's a risk because it can trigger this uh, uh, 
neg negative uh, uh, spillover, yeah, you you got it right. If this, it might be a risk, and it might might be a serious risk. It explains why the ECB, contrary to the Fed, is continuing an ultra loose monetary policy. The deflationary spiral, to simplify it, is when consumers see that things get cheaper for a protected period of time. They say, "Let's wait. We get it. We get it uh, cheaper. Uh, we, we get it cheaper uh, later on." The seller see, "Oh, uh, I'm lowering the prices. People don't come in. I need to lower them more." Producers see, "Oh, even if I sell the same amount of stuff, my sales are shrinking. My margin is shrinking. I need to shrink my cost base." including payroll, where the consumer, this loop uh, closes and he gets two signals. It pays off to delay uh, purchases and the situation in the labor market is shaky, so let's, let's be more, more careful. It's, uh, as we have seen in the case of Japanese scenario, before we move to the next slide, uh, the trick with the deflationary spiral, it's very difficult to break out of that negative, negative loop. Uh, in Japan, they have tried a lot of the things Therefore, the American Central Bank and the European Central Bank, actually, their uh, approach is to avoid this uh, deflationary scenario starting. Uh, one important thing about this decline of the consumer prices now, uh, that's why most of you got it right, that it might be a risk, is that it's being driven down by the commodities, oil, foodstuff. Net of the oil and foodstuff, the core inflation is slowing down. It's uh, alarmingly away from the inflation target of the ECB, but it's still in the positive territory. Also, we see a recovery of the growth. We actually had a experience with the deflation for five months between May and October 2009. Because the growth was accelerating, acceleration of the growth pulled out the uh, prices out of these negative <coughs> levels. And just one last remark uh, regarding the Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, see economies. I, I think the answer, what is the biggest industry, is uh, obvious uh, in the CE. I just uh, to keep you engaged, uh, wonder whether you know uh, which is the second major industry in Central Eastern Europe mining, electronics, automotive, base metals. Uh, that's, uh, uh, obviously, the automotive I don't need to uh, discuss very much. Uh, in fact, uh, CE. Uh, automotive cluster is the reason why as much as one third of the industrial sales in CE are comprised, especially when we speak about Czech Republic, Hungary and Slovakia are comprised of the uh, sales of the automotive sector. It is even more when you take into account the sub, sub suppliers of the automotive. Let's wait for the results. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but. Uh, the electronics is also very important. Uh, basically, yeah, you got it right. Uh, electronics is the second biggest industry uh, in the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, base metals play also an important role. Mining is negligible, actually. Uh, so that, 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 that was the uh, bit more uh, tricky question. Yeah, what we see in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, consumer confidence has been beaten down for several years, it now is starts to recover. That's the green line. Industrial confidence basically follows where the uh, economy, where the uh, eurozone economy uh, goes. Here is this illustration of the specifics of the of the CE industries. The big ones, uh, automotive, uh, electronics, base metals, comprise almost one half of the of the all the sales. That's something to keep in mind. So. Even if you have what we have seen in 2012, 2013, even if you have recession in some of those remaining eight mi minor industries, the success of these three can really uh, overshadow uh, the, the headline data. The headline data for Slovakia in particular now are very upbeat. We have seen double digit growth of industrial orders in uh, August. We see improvement in the labor market, unemployment at the lowest levels since uh, spring 2009. What's very important, we see a recovery in the wages, in the real wages, even though it's nothing threatening, but it's at the best levels uh, almost since the beginning of the recession. What's particular about the economic growth, not only in Slovakia, but also Czech Republic and Hungary, 
this year and the next is that domestic demand started to contribute with timeline uh, of the, the labor market recovery helped to uh, propel also the domestic demand. And just one last slide and very simple and easy quiz for you. Uh, speaking of improvement in uh, the unemployment, which of the C country has the lowest unemployment? Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland. I guess this, this should be this should be the easy one. And here just while we wait for the for the result. So when looking at the headline figures about unemployment, and that's something that you as head managers consider a lot, one has to keep in mind that not all unemployment is the same. The three major components of the unemployment from the economic viewpoint are structured well. First is cyclical unemployment, that's easy. Economy does well, people get jobs. Economy does badly, people lose jobs. Then there is frictional unemployment, people who are between jobs. And depending on how flexible the labor market is, that depends how long people wait before they find a new opportunity. But the third one, and that's the most tricky in Central and Eastern Europe, structural unemployment, people whose structure of the qualification does not fit the needs of the labor market and therefore it might be, uh, uh, it might be tricky to get out of it. You got it perfectly right, even though, yeah, <coughs> the people. Uh, let's, let's see, let's see, let's see the next slide. Uh, just, just, just to make the last point, this is my uh, the, the last slide. Uh, regarding the, the major risk factor for you as the risk managers, uh, correct. Czech Republic, now competing with the Hungary, but has, and for long, has had the lowest uh, unemployment, whereas Slovakia has been a laggard. And here, just one uh, remark. When you look at the bottom of the unemployment in uh, August 2008, which was 7.6%, a lot of the companies in Slovakia actually had troubles to find the, uh, the employees. They had to pass them from Romania or other countries, really, uh, for qualified jobs. You know, though you could, you could really ask, you know, 7.5% of people without jobs. The trick is that a big chunk of the unemployment in Slovakia is the structural unemployment. Just people who are long-term unemployed because the structure of their uh, qualification does not fit the structure of the uh, labor needs. Few last remarks regarding our group, which is self-evident. Uh, one thing that few people know that 49.99% uh, of the uh, shareholders of the spare bank are actually uh, in, in the in international institutional investors on the stock market. We are present in the nine countries of the CE, including Germany. And just a few quick, uh, few quick numbers regarding regarding my employer. So just to sum it up. I'll run uh, over my time a little bit. We are in a relatively optimistic uh, outlook <coughs> phase of the recovery in the Eurozone. There are risks, such as <coughs> deflation, uh, which are being addressed by this ultra uh, monetary policy. In C in particular, we are in unusual period of economic expansion supported by um, domestic demand, supported by uh, recovery of the labor market. If you have any questions, either now or in the future, I, I add my contact information. Thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you for all the quizzes. You have been really a uh, great audience. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir, just a very quick question. Um, in less than two years' time, the UK has a referendum as to whether it stays or leaves the EU. If, and some of the evidence is showing that it could happen, the, e the British people decide to leave the EU, do you see that having a material effect on the trading relationships that exist currently? Or would it make it any better or any worse? Uh, diffi difficult question. First of all, I think the worst case scenario would be bad for both. I think UK makes an important contribution in EU and we think the change that EU has to take to become more business friendly and more flexible uh, place. I think it would be pity also for the for the UK, especially speaking from the viewpoint of the financial, financial U, UK is a natural financial center of the world and EU in particular. I don't know uh, how long that would hold in case the UK would just find itself outside of the, the biggest economy in the world, uh, actually the the EU economy is bigger than the American when taken combined. It's, it's half a billion market. Uh, let's keep, keep that in mind. Uh, speaking on the effects, uh, it 
could have, if, if there would be the worst case scenario of the uh, Brexit, of the, uh, Britain leaving, as I have illustrated, the Lehman Brothers was bad for the real economy. Grexit, the risk of Eurozone falling apart, was even bigger. And actually, at the time when there was this heated discussion about what Greece leaving Euro might mean for the economy, it would be very negative. People just pointed out, ignore Greece, it's just a 11 million country. Brexit is the, is the, is the real risk, so uh, yeah. The, the, the worst case scenario in the case of the UK referendum would, be, would not be good for, for, for anybody. On the other note, one has to keep in mind that the way how it is phrased, all this plan is, uh, UK wants to renegotiate uh, the terms of, uh, under which it continues to uh, function in the, in the EU. I think for both sides, it's the same as in the case of the Greece, both sides do understand the detrimental consequences of the worst case uh, scenario, so I think there will be consensus reached and the uh, UK government will be able to come back to the voters and say, look, we have negotiated the better terms for us uh, in the EU. And part of that negotiation, part of, part of what the UK is pushing for because of its own interests, it's actually good for the economy. Uh, this, this, this UK push for more business friendly EU is something that will benefit all the other EU countries. So I'm, I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic, but yeah, if you remember that slide with the Lehman Brothers impact on the, on the US labor market from 200,000 to 800,000 in a matter of month, month to month, uh, this kind of events can have very profound impact on the real economy. Okay, John Barron, um, actually from ACCE. Quick question, well, one observation, first of all, is that I've seen comment in the UK press that Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, is about to enter the, the fray as regards the, the, the exit from, from the Eurozone. That's the first thing. But the second thing is a slightly embarrassing question for you, perhaps, as the employer, employee of a Russian-owned organization. And so, therefore, you know, if it's too embarrassing or awkward for you to answer, I, I, I do understand. There is also a situation at the moment where, as regards the Russian economy, um, it is in a, a difficult situation. And yet, Mr. Putin has engaged a, a lot of money on fighting a campaign in the Middle East. Do you feel that in the longer term there could be a knock-on effect into the, into the economies of Central and Eastern Europe? Uh, first, on this, I'm not an expert on the UK politics, and I also, one has to understand that some of the signals that are being sent to the voters before the vote might be part of the, of the tactical maneuvering. Um, but, I mean, for the city of, from the viewpoint of the city of London, or when you look at also at the surveys among British entrepreneurs, they all do understand that Britain outside of EU is, is, uh, is nuts, uh, to make it easy. On the second question, I wouldn't like to comment on the, on the political, political questions or situation, but the Middle East situation, I want to reflect with respect to the, this migration crisis that we do experience. And that, that's the migration crisis from the viewpoint of the economist, that's a no-brainer. In the long term, the benefits of migration, economic benefits, outweigh the cost. We have seen it in the US. There is a plethora of academic uh, evidence of, uh, of such. Uh, there is a lot of economists actually saying that, well, these thrifty Germans actually could be forced to stimulate the domestic demand by accepting all those migrants and helping them to, to, uh, to integrate. Uh, but, but part of the reason why we now all of a sudden fret about the the migrant crisis is that we have ignored what's going on in the Middle East for four, four years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I'm, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but resolving that situation uh, could, could help. And also when it comes to Syria in particular, there's the, the, this big issue. Dictatorships are bad, no question about that. Uh, the thing is, what comes after? And we have seen what came after the Arab Spring did away with many of the dictators in the northern Africa. And, and the question is, what kind of what kind of stability 
is uh, actually actually uh, bet, bet, better for uh, better for for us. Mm. Um, but uh, again, it's 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 a it's a it's a complicated complicated matter, and I'm not not a geopolitical expert. One one thing to keep in mind, and that that was my point about the summer 2014, geopolitical tensions can have a negative knock-on effect on the business confidence. Mm. Uh, what we have seen during uh, the escalation of some of the geopolitical tensions last last summer was that indeed it did drone down German economic output, subsequently also CE economic output. So the, the, the impact for the CE to answer your question is not direct. That's why I emphasize so much. Look at the Germany, look at the Germany. The impact on the business confidence, on the soft indicators, which then uh, spill over into real economy is, uh, we have seen it very recently. I can hear you, I can repeat your question. Okay. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I'll try again. Laurie Beagle from uh, Forest International. Uh, you mentioned a lot about the automotive industry, um, and the CE growth depends a lot on the automotive industry. Thank you. That's better. Um, I've, uh, are there too many eggs in one basket, do you think? I know you mentioned the electronics, but uh, automotive is still a, a lot, lot bigger. Yes. Yes, uh, simple ask, uh, answer is this high concentration of the industry is something that, that's worrisome. One has to keep in mind, when it comes to automotive, one has to understand uh, <coughs> two aspects. First of all, big part of that automotive cluster is part of the restructuring of the European automotive. Consumers want cheap cars. If you want to sell 10,000 euro cars, you simply cannot survive, cannot uh, meaningfully produce it with Western European cost. So part of the Central and Eastern European cluster, especially when it comes to French manufacturers or German manufacturers, is geographic optimization of their cost structure. Uh, that, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. So there, we, we eventually, it might be an issue looking into the far future, uh, but that's one thing. And the second thing, and that also applies to even Jaguar or uh, Korean auto manufacturers, for them CE is the entry point into the half a billion EU market. For example, Kia has very small, and it was even worse, market share. And what we have seen in the case of the Korean manufacturers, that if you have a very small market share, even on a shrinking pie, if you manage to increase your market share, your production goes up. And that, that's, that's also that what, what we have seen throughout the crisis in the case, case of the Korean manufacturers. They simply make good cars for bad times, so in, even in turbulent times, uh, they were doing well. And they produce in CE, not for the 5 million market of Slovakia or 10 million market of Czech Republic, they produce for half a billion market of the EU. So this is like a, uh, like a half. In, in the long term, we need to be careful. Uh, the, the automotive as such will go through uh, dramatic changes brought about by technology, including self-driving cars. Uh, but that, that's something to, to keep in mind. From, from the viewpoint of the economists or, 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 or politicians, the reason why there is uh, so much auto manufacturing, in, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, apart from its geographic location, etc., it's because of the resources. We have had underutilized resources, simply said, uh, skilled people who before used to produce tanks and all sorts of special machinery for the arms, which went into gold drums after the fall of the Iron Curtain. In, in Slovakia, basically, we have reinvented this underutilized resource. We were, you know, the, the, the car manufacturing in Slovakia didn't appear from scratch. It's basically a continuation of that production of the heavy machinery, especially for military purposes, in a different world, uh, different, in a different, in a different uh, setup. And also, when it comes to, also Jaguar is part of this global expansion. And uh, just one, one remark, one could again reflect when speaking about geographic optimization of cost. Uh, Porsche Cayenne, Volkswagen Touareg, all these jacks that are to be produced in Slovakia are not produced here because <coughs> of the lowest cost. It's because of the best or, or of acceptable uh, proportion between uh, cost and qualification of labor. That's something that we see 
shared service centers that are mushrooming in Slovakia and Central Europe. That's not really about cost, because you need to you need to have a reliable, well qualified labor force or labor force uh, in in the first place, and only once the the labor force of, of qualifies in that condition, only then you look at how much does it cost. Does it cost you? So yeah, it, it, it is a risk. Mm -hmm. uh, it is mitigated by these factors that it's the hub for all the uh, EU producing good cars for the bad times. Uh, that it's uh, part of uh, global expansion in the case of the Jaguar, and in, in in part because it's not the lowest cost, but the good proportion of the uh, qualification to cost of labor. And as we have seen, uh, the, the the labor qualification is not that easy to duplicate when we speak about the risk of these guys moving out. And then the sun cost is enormous. I mean, people fret about uh, automotive manufacturers moving on. Once you invest 1 billion euro or 2 billion euro, you want to see your return on investment first. Thank you very much for your attention and again, thank you.